Greetings to you all. It's, uh, here we are, another message, how the time flies. And here in Canada, we are celebrating uh, national holiday, Mother's Day. At least I'm calling it a national holiday. And uh, so I just wanted to start by saying to all you mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. And thank you, Lord, so much for mothers. Well, here we are. Thank you for having me uh, in your places and spaces as we look at um, a message today, which I hope and pray brings you a blessing and a motivation to serve the Lord. So as we think about these things, uh, let's just begin by making a few points. Okay, let's talk about a fellow that's not around anymore, Abraham Lincoln. Well, Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States, and he said something about character that I want to share with you. Character. Uh, quote, character is a tree and the reputation, and reputation like a shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. Helen Keller once said about character, quote, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet, only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened. 19th century uh, evangelist Dwight L. Moody, speaking of character, said, quote, Character is what a man is in the dark. That's pretty interesting. Well, it's in, as I did my research this week, uh, I came across an article by Faith and Public Life, writing on the issue of character and courage in the 21st century. And it caught my attention. And they asked the important question when we consider our current social cultural climate. Quote, is it possible to maintain a sense of character and courage in the 21st century? Important question, I think. Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, writing to his dear friend and fellow gospel worker Timothy in 1 Timothy said, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. You see, Timothy had a number of hills to climb as he pastored the church in Ephesus. And to mention two as we begin. One, one false teacher had done some serious damage to the church at Ephesus. And uh, Timothy uh, was instructed to do the work to sort some of that out, or all of that out. The other one was, in the first century um, social and cultural climate, Timothy, who was most likely, according to the majority of scholars that I've read, uh, was most likely in his mid-30s. And he was considered, in that culture, too young to be in such an important leadership position. For centuries, elders in the church were those who had lived a long life, age-wise, and their experience, their wisdom, their ability to navigate and provide leadership was sought after. That's just kind of how it worked in those days. And I think there's a lot of truth of that even in our day today. Anyways, what we should know, this is what Paul focused with Timothy. See, he encouraged Timothy to press on and to live a visible and active godly character as he led the church in Ephesus. See, age and experience don't always equal the sound integrity and character. And we, I think, can understand that. This includes godly character and courage that we all need today in our current culture. We also know it was the Holy Spirit working out the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Timothy's godly character, his conduct and ministry, that Timothy would be the leader and teacher the Ephesian church needed at that particular time. So please turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Our focus today will be even the last verses of this chapter 11 through to 16, but we want to take in the context so uh, get a bigger picture. So we'll begin in verse 1. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through to 16. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving 
by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for, the, for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the scripture, to preaching and to teaching, do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Verse 15. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may, uh, everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. Bless the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your, um, your word, and we thank you, Lord, as we look at this, that you, by your spirit, will help us not only to understand it in our minds, but to, to work it into our hearts, and then from there into our hands and feet as we serve you and others in our lives. So we thank you so much for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, we now are going to spend our time unpacking verse 11 through 16. And as we do that, uh, we want to keep in mind three points. One, context. What we don't want to do is isolate six verses here in Paul's letter from the rest of the letter. So be mindful of that. Two, we also acknowledge that the text is addressing Timothy's spiritual leadership in the church at Ephesus. And three, point number two, does not exclude nor minimize the exhortation in these verses for the body of Christ as a whole. For each and every believer in Ephesus, and by extension, the inspired letter applies to each of us today who call Jesus Lord and Savior. So here's how you can do, do it simply as we start. You put your name in place of Timothy's. Chapter 1, verse 2, Paul said to Timothy. And you do it this way. To fill in your name. Fill in your name. God calls us all his sons and daughters. He calls all of us to set an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And we can easily organize these verses uh, from three angles. So the first one we'll call character, the second one calling, and the third one conviction. So we have character, calling, and conviction. So let's begin with character. And out of the gate, we need to say out loud and clearly, character counts. Someone once said, Quote, good character takes a lifetime to build and a, moment, and a moment to destroy. So how true that is. You know, we don't have to do an in-depth scientific research study to see that the current culture that is chasing after and promotes fame, fortune, and power is sorely lacking in good character. And when it comes to godly character, the thing that we as followers of Christ pursue well, one would have a better chance of finding a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow than godly character in the mainstream culture of our day. And sadly, it has even now moved its way into the evangelical Christian culture as well. But of course, I digress. Let's continue. Let's look at verse 11. Let's get that one out of the way a bit. Um, he's, Paul said to Timothy, command and teach these things. We asked the generalistic question, what things? Everything that Paul said from verse 1 right here until we hit verse 11. Okay? Command and teach these things. Verse 1 through the 10. Verse 12, we encounter, we encounter 
the building blocks, the foundation, if you will, of a good and godly character. And for ease of remembrance, why don't we call them five for five? That's easy to remember, five for five. And what are five for five? Well, speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. We see these all here in verse 12. And let's deal with these one at a time. We'll be moving through this as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, maybe you want to just pay attention if you're interested. Speech. Now, we need to, uh, again, remember uh, point two that we said earlier, that this, these uh, words here are directed to Timothy. And speech from Timothy would be primarily what he teaches and preaches from the Word of God. But also, we can look at this because of the context of the New Testament and even the Gospels. It is the words that come out of our mouths as well. You know, the saying, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. That is not true. The words that come out of our mouths can hurt. They can even do more damage than sticks or stones can to our bodies. And also, this is very interesting, the words that come out of our mouths actually can reveal what is in our hearts. Jesus said this, for example, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Did you, did you get that? That evil thoughts come. And he lists some of them. Sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Now that's quite a list. Jesus went on to say all evils come from the inside. And they defile that person. Here in this text, our text this morning, or today, I mean, pardon me, Paul exhorts Timothy to set an example to the believers in speech. And here's the point. Brothers and sisters, you and I are to set an example to all in our speech. The words that come out of our mouths. The Apostle Paul said, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Are the words that come out of our mouths building others up, are they for the benefit of others? You see, our speech, our words, shapes and forms our character. Shapes and forms our character. Next one, conduct. So in keeping with a good and godly character, conduct, or we can put it even better, righteous living, shape Timothy's godly conduct, uh, character as it will shape ours. The Apostle Peter, in his first letter, reminds his readers, and us today by extension, to be alert and fully sober. And he's not talking about drinking here. To be alert and fully sober, to not conform to the evil desires that they had, that we had, when we lived in arrogance, in ignorance. That's the first, letter, the first chapter of 1 Peter. He said to them, as he, said, as he says, as remember the one who called you is holy. So be holy in all that you do. It is written, for it is written, now Peter quotes from the Old Testament where God speaks and says, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. So this brings up another question, or brings up a question. How hard is it to live a righteous life? Pardon me, a righteous life, a holy life in a culture that is anything but godless. Anything but that, that is profane, that is godless. Well, it's very hard. And this asks the next question, where we're looking at the context of this letter. What was life like in Ephesus during the days of Timothy and the church in, in, in Ephesus in the first century? Well, BibleTools.org has been a great help for us. At least I'll share that with you. It's been great help for me, that we can get a really good and clear picture. The Ephesian culture would be in many ways no different than ours today. Some have even suggested that Ephesus, in many ways, can be compared to New York City. Ephesus was the epicenter for the worship. Epicenter, you know what that means? The epicenter of the worship, for the worship of the fertility god Artemis, or what the Romans called Diana. And the temple of Artemis, which was just built outside the city, was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. Ephesus, in Paul's time, was also an economic powerhouse. 
It was a chief commercial center for all of Western Asia Minor. Where was that? Where is that today? Look at the country of Turkey, all on the west side. They were the chief uh, commercial center of all that territory. Along with the commercial success of that, uh, you know, they had shipping from the Mediterranean. They had two major roads in those days that provided commercial access to inland and the coast, via the coast and inland. And along with all that success, the Temple of Artemis became the primary banking institution for all of Asia Minor. This is where they kept their money. As to the moral character of Ephesus, one, of the philosoph one philosopher of the day living in Ephesus commented that the citizens of Ephesus, uh, the citizens, pardon me, of Ephesus, I'm going too fast, the citizens of Ephesus were only fit for drowning. And this very same philosopher commented that he lived among terrible uncleanliness. And I don't think he was talking about clothes. You see, Ephesus was not unlike our culture. And it was a profane culture. And this was a setting that Timothy and the believers in Ephesus were exhorted to live as Peter would call all believers to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. You see, friends, our conduct, our conduct shapes and forms our character. Now we have love. You know, I was thinking about this. Of all the examples of love we could find anywhere and everywhere in a person, Jesus' exa example has no equal. One time Jesus was, draw as, uh, was drawing closer to his arrest. As Jesus was drawing closer to his arrest and crucifixion, he spent the remaining time prior to his arrest comforting and preparing his disciples. And in chapter 15 of John's Gospel, we see Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he said to them this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Then he went on to say, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Then Jesus reminded them, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Friends, godly character is infused, it is permeated, it exudes self-sacrificial service. Love, godly love, is self-sacrificial and it shapes and forms our character. Then we have faith. There's a lot we could say about this, but when we consider faith, we do need to reference Timothy's calling to preach and teach in Ephesus. As was mentioned earlier, the text is purposely highlighting the character, calling, and conviction of godly leaders in the church then and even today. And this was in direct contrast to the false teachers who were anything but godly, whose faith was, as Paul put it, was, was shipwrecked, was destroyed. If you go to the 1 Corinthians 12, another one of Paul's letters, it reminds us there in chapter 12 that the Holy Spirit distributes the spiritual gifts as he sees fit. And all believers, by the way, have spiritual gifts. All true believers. All, and the question is, are all believers called to be elders and pastors like Timothy was? Of course not. Are all believers become more and more like Jesus? Yes. Paul reminds us that to fight the good fight, we do so by holding on to faith and a good conscience. They partner. They're two peas in the same pod. Paul also said that his instruction, that his instruction to stop or to prevent the false teachers to continue was rooted in what? Love, not anger. He said love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You see that all working together. Friends, all these graces, all these wonders and graces are from God. So faith rooted in Christ shapes and forms our character. 
Then we have purity. Paul instructed the church of Thessalonica to live in order to please God. Why? Because he said that it is God's will to be sanctified. The question is, what does sanctified mean? What does sanctified mean here in the biblical text? Well, technically, it refers to the sanctification of the heart and life in every believer by the Holy Spirit. That's technically. But practically, it is the working out of the command of God, who said, be holy because I am holy. When we consider the immoral and profane culture of Ephesus, you and I, every day we face an immoral and profane culture. Purity, my friends, is a command and is a must for leaders in Jesus' Jesus's church. And it is God's will for all believers today. It is God's will. We could talk a lot about uh, a lot of the physical impurities of the world that we have. For example, pornography. It, pornography is such a debilitating, dehumanizing, uh, demeaning product. And it's sold all by billions, for billions of dollars. It destroys lives. And people laugh and scoff at a person like me who says that, but it's the truth. And the truth hurts, my friends. But purity is a manifestation of holiness in thought, word, and deed. I'm not talking about prudeness. I'm talking about holiness. Biggest, big difference. And it shapes and forms our character. So there we have it, folks. Five for five. Easy way to remember it. Five for five. Speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. This is the foundation of a good and godly character, which is the foundation of a faithful servant of God. So now we're in verse 13 and 14, moving on. We had character, now we move into calling. And we begin uh, with a statement that we all need to hear with our ears and understand. God calls you and me to serve. That's right, folks. He calls you and me to serve. To serve God and to serve others. And if we're not serving God and others, then we need to take a really good and long, hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves why. Why? Because you see, a characteristic of false teachers in Paul's day and those in our day and everywhere in between and going forward is selfishness. And selfishness is a display, a manifestation of sinful human pride. And sooner or later, Selfishness raises its head as pride desires, just desires hungrily to be exalted, to be, in one sense, worshipped and adored. My friends, if you read the Gospels, you're going to see this. You're going to see that Jesus did not pull any punches with the religious leaders of Israel. And he called them some strong, strong things. He called them hypocrites. He called them blind guides. He called them blind fools. He called them snakes. He called them a brood of vipers and other things. Wow, what did these religious leaders to get such a tongue lashing from Jesus? Well, Jesus said and stated the obvious. Everything they do, everything they do is done for people to see. They love the place of honor at banquets. The most important seats in the synagogues love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. How was this to be, my friends? How was this to be the very ones that were to preach and teach, to model the holiness of God, were all show and no substance? They were all dressed up in their fancy robes and outward signs of religious zeal. But they didn't fool God and they didn't fool Jesus. Because Jesus knew their hearts when he said this about them. They are full of greed and self-indulgence. Man, oh man, do we see that in our culture today. We see, we see empty, vacuous people spouting and shouting, follow me, follow me, I'll show you the way. And they are empty inside. And they want to be worshipped and adored Men, women, children, they do this. People in the church do this. And Jesus said they are full of greed and self-indulgence. 
I need to look in the mirror, you need to look in the mirror and hear Jesus here. But Paul said to Timothy, devote yourself. He said, devote yourself. Commit yourself. Do not neglect your gift. You see, Timothy was commissioned by God, called by God to spiritual leadership of the church in Ephesus. He said, Timothy, devote yourself to the work of the ministry you were called to, the public reading of scriptures, to preaching and teaching, to leading, to leading, to bringing glory to God. Brothers and sisters, you who are listening to me, who call yourself followers of Christ, we have been called and commissioned by God, the Holy Spirit, to serve God and others. Devote yourselves to the work of the ministry. Do not neglect your gift. This is not a time now in the 21st century to take a holiday, to retire. No, no. We need to do the work of the ministry. Well, last two verses, verses 15 and 16, we have conviction. Another way we can look at conviction, uh, we can use words like reasoning and truth and attitude and logic and thinking and cornerstone. But uh, not cornerstone, thinking. Let's just stay with the word conviction. So we have character and calling, and now we have conviction. Dictionary.com defines conviction in a number of ways. And one really does stand out as we attempt to understand the role of conviction in our lives. And it's this, a fixed or firm belief. Paul exhorted Timothy to be what? To be diligent in these matters. What matters? The spiritual gift God had given to Timothy to preach and teach and lead the church. And let's think this through together. The Ephesian church needed plenty of work, didn't they? They had all this uh, you know, disorder and misunderstanding. Amongst the faithful believers, they had controversies and a failing leadership. And they had this pressure from the surrounding culture. Remember, we talked about the, the, the Ephesian uh, Ephesus. It was an economic powerhouse. It was a, it was a, it was a moral, uh, moral cesspool in a lot of ways. They were, they were pressured by the, the, that culture to, to conform, to join others in their godless behavior. And Paul reminded Timothy that he was, and he says directly, a man of God. It's the only place in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, pardon me, that someone was called a man of God. And he said to fight the faith, to fight the fight of the faith. And in chapter 6, he said, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, Timothy, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Friends, conviction is fuel is fuel to a good and godly character, to a faithful servant of God. Someone once said, quote, conviction of what, you may ask? Have a conviction about the things God has called you. Have a conviction about the things God has told you. Live by these convictions. Be prepared to give up anything so that you can fulfill your conviction. And Paul said to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. And we, we need to ask this question, what fueled Paul's life and ministry? Well, let's just use his own words. In the letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 12, he said to advance the gospel. What fueled Timothy's life to advance the gospel? What fuels your life? Is your conviction to advance the gospel, to do the work of the ministry, to use the gifts, the spiritual gifts God has given you for the church, for the edification of the church, for the uplifting of the saints, for the community around us, to be a person of, uh, uh, of solutions, not a person of, that takes and destroys. There's a fellow by the name of Watchman Nee. He was a Chinese church leader and teacher in the 20th century. In the early 1920s, and Watchman Nee began to establish churches uh, throughout China. And after the Communist Revolution of 1949, uh, Christians in all of China were persecuted along with Watchman Nee. In the early 1950s, Nee was imprisoned for his faith in Christ and would spend the rest of his life in jail, or in prison, pardon me, uh, dying May 30th, 1972. And Nee said this once, quote, if you perform your part, if you perform your part, God will fulfill his. 
If you perform your part, God will fulfill his. So there we have it. Character, calling, and conviction. The foundation of a faithful, godly servant. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this format that we can use these days to to get the message out. I pray that those who hear this message would receive it with an open mind and an open heart, that they would uh, think about the things that you are saying to us through your word. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, your word teaches us that nothing that you, that your word goes out does not come back empty, and we pray that that would do that in our lives. Thank you so much, Lord, for this time, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, with you. Uh, God bless you, and you have yourself a great week. Shalom.